Hi there, this is Brad Chamberlain. I'm the technical lead of the Chapel Project at Cray, now HPE. And this is my welcome and state of the project talk for CHU 2020. Um, this is actually a re-recording of the talk because we forgot to hit record during the workshop itself for my first talk. Um, in case you don't know why you're here at CHU uh, and you don't know what Chapel is, it's a modern parallel programming language. It is portable and scalable, so it can run from laptops to commodity clusters, the cloud, and the largest supercomputers. And it's an open source and collaborative project. So it's developed at GitHub, and it's distributed under the Apache 2.0 license, which is fairly permissive. The two main goals of Chapel are to support general parallel programming. So you can think of this as, if I have a parallel algorithm in my mind and some parallel hardware I'd like to run that on, Chapel ought to allow me to do that, and if not, we're not succeeding in this goal. And the second is to make parallel programming at scale far more productive than it is today. And you can think of this as trying to create a language whose code is as easy to read and write as, say, Python, but whose performance competes with C or Fortran plus MPI plus OpenMP. Now, a lot of people, when you tell them you're doing a language, they say, you know, why are you doing that? It's really hard. I mean, it has technical challenges, of course, but there are also big social challenges in terms of getting people to use a new language. And this is a slide from a keynote talk that Kathy Yellick gave at this workshop a couple of years ago called Why Languages Matter More Now Than Ever. And it was in relation to the uh, architectural changes and challenges that are occurring at extreme scale systems. And she argued in that talk that languages had syntactic and semantic and performance-related and algorithmic-related benefits. And uh, you can see a brief description of some of that here. But this is a lot of the reason that we think languages are very important for parallel computing. We think that they can provide better syntax, better semantics, performance optimizations in the compiler, and new algorithms that you might not come up with otherwise. This is a slide that talks a little bit about uh, how the Chapel project works over the course of a year. We tend to do two releases per year, one in the spring and one in the fall. And then about a month after that, we release uh, very detailed release notes that go through the release in quite a bit of detail uh, about what the changes are and what the performance impacts were and things like that. Now, our latest releases were Chapel 121 and 122. These were released on April 9th and 16th, respectively. Um, and that year's wrong, I just noticed. It should be 2020. And, um, I'll talk about why we did two releases in a few slides. Uh, in the spring, we also do CHU, um, which is this workshop, the Chapel Implementers and Users Workshop. It's typically co-located with IPDPS or PLDI, although this year, due to COVID-19, we are holding it online. And then it's supercomputing in November. This is, of course, a big event for the industry. Um, there we have our annual Chug Happy Hour, Chapel Users Group. And Chug and CHU are sort of set up to be compliments to one another. And then from year to year, we do various talks or tutorials or panels or bops or posters, just depending on what the opportunities are. And then all year round, we're doing development, user support, giving talks, doing research visits, uh, manning our social media, and so on. So today, of course, we're here for CHU. So we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, typically, CHU, if you'd attended in the past, might have looked something like this, um, although this photo wasn't actually taken at CHU. Um, this year, again, due to COVID, we're doing it remotely and distributed on, and online. So it looks a little bit more like this, live from our home offices or in some cases our bedrooms. Um, so this is our first time we've done this online. Um, and I'll say that while it's the first time, it's something we'd actually been considering doing anyway, um, in part because there are a lot of people who can't always travel to the conference where CHU is located, but who would like to attend or participate. And so we've been looking at doing a hybrid in-person online edition even prior to the pandemic. Um, but the pandemic sort of forced our hand a bit and moved us into the fully online world. Um, but we think now that we're past it, it was a good experience and it's something we hope to incorporate in future editions of CHU as well. Um, we're grateful to all our speakers who agreed to participate remotely. Um, they represent, or they'll be speaking from three different continents, four countries, I think if I counted right, five time zones and 11 organizations. And uh, it's really great that we got such a strong response, people who still wanted to participate despite the uh, distributed setting. About half of today's talks uh, are pre-recorded, and the other half will be live. Um, all of them featured live post-talk Q&A sessions. So all the authors were there, but some of them didn't want to hassle with 
uh, their internet connection staying up and things like that. Um, of course, now we're past the whole thing. All of those talks and uh, the Q&A sessions are available from the two websites. You can go there and revisit those talks if you were not able to attend the event when it happened live. Um, these are some technical details which don't really uh, matter now that we're not actually in CHU anymore, so we'll skip past that. I'd like to recognize the organizing committee for CHU. Benjamin Robbins was our general chair again. Um, you can see our steering committee here and our program committee who helped select the talks and the papers. And I want to particularly call out Kathy Olshnowski, who uh, was a great co-chair uh, for me in the program committee um, and helped me particularly because I tend to be conflicted with a lot of the submissions. Um, so she was a great help and I really appreciated her help. Um, but everyone on all the committees was really helpful. And uh, you know, if you like what you see at CHU this year, they get the credit. And if you don't, uh, you're welcome to blame me. This is the agenda for CHU as it went. Um, again, this is sort of the welcome and state of the project talk. And most of the day is made up of talks that were submitted to the program committee for evaluation. Um, we accepted them in both long and short talk formats, depending on how far along the work seemed to be. And they divided into these five categories, which I'll go into in a bit more detail. I wanna call out our keynote talk, which I'll talk more about uh, in the next slide in our CUDA. Um, and then we ended the day with an open discussion session. Um, typically when we meet for CHU, we have a second day that's a coding day, figuring that as long as we're all together, we might as well spend some time working through some coding challenges together or starting on some new collaborations, things like that. In the online format, it didn't seem as important to do that adjacent to CHU. But that's something we're still open to doing, either as a community or since there's not as much benefit to all necessarily doing it on the same day. If individual groups wanted to meet up online for coding sessions or things like that, that's something our group is definitely open to um, helping with or co-hosting or participating in. So let us know if that's of interest to you. Um, this is our CHU keynote. It was given by Dr. William or Bill Roos. Uh, the title of his talk was Arcuda, Chapel-Powered Interactive Supercomputing for Data Science. And you can see some uh, excerpts from the abstraction here, uh, sorry, from the abstract here. Um, Arcuda is uh, an application of Chapel that was premiered at CHU last year, CHU 2019. And it since has become one of the most exciting applications this past year uh, in Chapel. And so we invited Bill to speak about it. Bill's one of the two main developers on Arcuda. And uh, so his keynote is about um, this, this really cool library that basically gives you NumPy-like arrays in your Python environment. Um, you can run it from within Jupyter, say. And then all of the operations on those arrays are implemented in Chapel, running either on your laptop or out on a supercomputer or anything in between. And with this, they've been able to scale up to dozens of terabytes of data and to do operations on them at interactive speeds for the kind of data science that they need to do. Um, so I think this is a really exciting use of Chapel, and we're really excited that Bill was able to give the keynote this year. And I highly encourage you to check that out, uh, also available online. Now our technical talks for CHU fit into these five categories. We first started with a pair of talks from the Chapel team about some of the recent changes and evolution of the language. Uh, then we had our ACUDA session, which both included the keynote I just mentioned, and then a talk from our Elliot Ronahan on improving ARCUDA in performance, which was a big focus of the performance effort in this past release. Then we had an application section which was really great. We had four different applications um, spanning very different types of computation, um, both from academia and from national labs. Um, and for me, this is always an exciting session because it's great to see what different groups are and users are doing with Chapel. Uh, then we had a Chapel on GPUs session. If you're following Chapel, you might know that the official releases of Chapel don't really support GPUs other than through interoperating with existing GPU code. Um, this represents a couple of efforts being done in academia to try to blaze the trail for how Chapel might target GPUs. That's something that our team will be looking at more in the coming year as well. And then the last session was on implementing Chapel, and we had to talk both on uh, supporting distributed non-blocking algorithms in Chapel, and then another about um, some machine learning based optimizations in the compiler to uh, tune for data locality in an automated way. So that's my welcome to Chu talk. And then the other thing I usually do to kick off Chu is I give a state of the project um, talk. So this is, the, this is that part of the talk. And this just sort of summarizes some of the highlights over the past year since the 2019 state of the project talk. 
Um, so first of all, we've done three new major releases since Chu 2019, um, Chapel 120, Chapel 121, and Chapel 122. Again, uh, one of those was last fall, and then we did two releases this spring. Um, the second release, Chapel 122, is essentially identical to 121, but we made a change based on user request to switch from one-based indexing to zero-based index indexing for some of Chapel's built-in types, like tuples and strings. So those two releases are virtually identical with this one pretty significant change, and we broke that into its own release just to allow users to change over to it when they were ready to do so. Now, for all of these releases, um, I would say the primary focus areas were these four. Um, the first is an effort we call language stability, or Chapel 2.0. We'll talk more about that on the next slide. Um, improving Chapel's performance and scalability, always important for a parallel uh, supercomputing language. Improving interoperability, particularly with Python lately. And then improving portability. Um, and we've been particularly focused on Cray Shasta, uh, which is our next generation Cray system and architecture. And we are at the point now where early access customers can run Chapel on Shasta systems. So starting out with Chapel 2.0, um, the idea behind this is in my number of years working on Chapel, it seems to be the case that Chapel users simultaneously want things fixed or changed in language, which is um, understandable. Not everything has been perfect in the language ever. And at the same time, they don't like having their existing code break due to a new release coming out and fixing or changing something in the language. Um, now, I, I'm sort of poking fun, but both of these perspectives are completely understandable. Um, you want things to be better in the language, and at the same time, nobody likes their code breaking. Um, but these two things are obviously in tension with one another. So Chapel 2.0 is this concept of an upcoming release in which we will commit to not breaking core language features, and we'll also switch over to semantic versioning at that point, um, which is just a way of numbering your releases to show when breaking changes show up. Now, Chapel 120 and 122 this past year were the first two release candidates for Chapel 2.0. The concept is if one of those, um, if we don't make any breaking changes in those to the core language before the next release, we'll call that next release Chapel 2.0. So for example, at this point, if we, reach, if we reach the fall release without breaking anything, then that will become Chapel 2.0. Now last year at CHU 2019, I presented this short list of remaining key features to focus on for Chapel 2.0. And happily in the past year, we have made great progress with all of those. Except for one um, that's still a work in progress, constrained generics. Um, this is something we're still working towards as quickly as possible. And we're cautiously optimistic that this won't actually be a breaking change. So we don't think this will hold up Chapel 2.0. But we're trying to get a bit further with it to have more confidence in that statement. That's our current belief, however. And then in addition to these features that I listed at Chapel 20, or sorry, at CHU 2019, um, we've also done a number of other things uh, to help improve the language and sort of lock things down like the zero versus one based indexing that I mentioned. And uh, so there's been a huge amount of progress here. Um, there are many, many more, even smaller things that I didn't bother calling out on this slide. Um, and you can look at our release notes again to get a more complete list of what we've been doing in these areas or the changes file in your Chapel installation. So at this point, we think that Chapel 122 is a very strong candidate for Chapel 2.0. However, ultimately that decision is up to users and developers like those of you attending CHU or out there listening in the community. Um, and the other thing that's important to note, and is sometimes misunderstood, is that after Chapel 2.0, things can still evolve and improve in the language and library, simply not in breaking ways, right? So the goal is to uh, make existing code continue to work while still improving the language and evolving it in ways that make it more and more powerful over time. Now, the next pair of talks is going to focus more on this Chapel 2.0 topic. Uh, Michael Ferguson will be talking about stability in the Chapel language and this overall effort. And then Lydia Duncan will be talking about a specific area that we focused on, particularly in the last release for Chapel 2.0, uh, improving support for modules and namespaces in the language. Um, as I mentioned, you can also see Chapel's release notes. And if you click on these slides, uh, this is a clickable link that will get you to them. Or you can find them from the sidebar on our main web page. So the next area was Chapel performance improvements. Um, just to call out a few kind of my favorite improvements from the past year, in Chapel 120, we enabled an unordered optimization that had been implemented previously, but not enabled because we just didn't have enough confidence in it yet. And this essentially allows the compiler to change um, operations that it otherwise would implement synchronously into a more asynchronous form. 
And so my favorite example of this is, um, this loop here is the main loop of our HPC challenge random access benchmark. And it's basically a two line loop that does random accesses across a huge distributed array. And what you're seeing on this graph is a performance graph, so higher is better. Um, the x-axis is the number of locales, which are compute nodes. So this is going up to something like 18,000 cores. And um, higher is better since it's a performance graph. So you can see that um, between Chapel 119 and 120, by enabling this optimization, we got much better performance uh, without even changing the source code. And boy, it's funny what you see when you're recording these talks. Uh, I'm noticing there's a missing space in that in between in and zip in this code, so I apologize for that. Uh, but again, a really nice improvement for certain codes that benefit from this optimization, again, without any source changes. So this is the same source for HPCC RA that we've been using since the dawn of time, it feels like. Second optimization uh, was an optimization to bulk transfer. So this is when you're assigning between two arrays. And traditionally, uh, in many cases, we've done this element by element. So we copy each element uh, from one array to the other. And we're doing this across the network or even locally. That can result in a lot of overhead. So the optimization here was to do block distributed transfers, uh, sorry, bulk transfers between block distributed arrays and local arrays by default. And so in the code sample here, I'm just showing you an example. If I slice into a local array and assign that a slice of a distributed array, say, that's now going to be done with a single transfer if that slice is all um, on, a, on a single locale for the block array, or sort of as many as there are locales involved. Um, and this graph here is an execution time graph. This comes from our nightly performance graphs, which are like stock tickers for performance in Chapel. And in this case, it's an execution time graph. So you can see that in that time period between April and May when we enabled this optimization, um, these benchmarks that are essentially timing a bunch of different array transfer idioms in various ways between various types of arrays got remarkably better. Um, so this was a huge optimization, nice one that uh, Ben Harshberger on the team implemented. And then in the latest release, um, Engen on our team implemented a great optimization for the time required to create distributed domains and arrays. This is something we hadn't really done in the past because often in benchmarks, these creations of arrays and domains are outside of the timed portion of the benchmark. So something you can kind of amortize away. But for codes that are doing a lot of dynamic creation and destruction of arrays, like Arcuda, for example, does this, um, the overhead can be kind of annoying and a bit of a bottleneck. And it didn't scale well at all. Uh, so what Engen did was dive into this and essentially just really tune uh, the creation of these distributed domains and arrays to reduce the execution time. And the graphs here are showing the time required to create a distributed array, like the array A in my code sample here. This is, again, an execution time graph. So the higher curve is on the left, uh, the number of communications, and on the right, the amount of time required for 120. And then the lower line, which is pretty close to the x-axis, in fact, you can barely see it on the left uh, graph, is the new release. And you can see it went from a curve that sort of got uh, frustratingly bad as we went up to 18,000 locales to one that is much, much flatter now and scales much better. Uh, so this is a huge win for codes that are doing a lot of creation and destruction of arrays dynamically. And then the last one I want to call out is uh, in the latest release, we did a number of optimizations that uh, improve Arcuda and codes that do things like Arcuda. And later on in Chu, Elliot Ronahan will be giving a talk on that. And again, you can see that online now on the Chu webpage. And the last place I want to call out, or last area I want to call out is Python interoperability. This didn't get nearly as much attention as the last few topics, but I think it's pretty cool and worth highlighting, so I wanted to call it out. I should also say I'm not a Python programmer, so if I've made a mistake here, uh, forgive me, but I think I've got this right. On the left is, say, a chapel program that exports a single procedure. This is a multi-locale hello world, so this will basically print a hello message from every compute node on which your program is running in parallel. And on the right, I have a Python code that's essentially going to import uh, the library created from this program and uh, basically call out to that hello routine. You can see I've attached the export keyword to that procedure, and that means I want to make this routine accessible to other languages. Um, so you can see I do a setup call here, which says, how many locales do I want to run this on? And then I can make my call to hello. And at the bottom, you can see the compile line used to do that. I'm using the library Python uh, flag in order to create a Python library from this source code. And then you can see me firing up Python to uh, run my, my Python script that uses it. Um, this is a very simple example, obviously, to fit on this slide. But 
Uh, this feature also supports the ability of passing and returning simple data types between Python and Chapel. And more complex data types are uh, not always supported currently. So next steps here are to basically flesh out the set of types that are supported and make more and more general Chapel procedures be able to be exported in this way. Uh, but this has been pretty exciting, particularly as people look at calling into Chapel from Python more and more. And then a few additional highlights since last year's Chew. Um, one is that we've had a number of really notable use cases of Chapel really come to fruition, I think, this past year and really sort of take off. Um, and these happen both um, in academia and at labs, and they cover both sort of traditional sciences like simulations of the physical world, say, as well as data science types of applications. And the first four of the, or actually, yeah, the first four of these um, will actually be talked about in Chew. So if you're interested in any of these, you can go click up the Chew talks about them and hear more about them. Um, and then I also wanted to call out in the past year that Arcuda was open sourced. So I mentioned that it was, I think, first spoken about publicly in Chew last year, um, and it was open sourced in the fall, which is really exciting and lets a lot of people tap into uh, the power of uh, what the Arcuda developers have, have implemented. Um, when I was putting these slides together, I was looking for other highlights since last year, and I noticed we hit three what I'll call odometer flips since Chew 2019. This is when sort of some count of something sort of hit a nice round number. So the 10,000 here represents the number of tests in the full Chapel test suite, and currently it's actually up to like 11,000 some. Uh, but we sort of went over that 10,000 uh, mark this year, and that gives you a sense of how much testing we do on Chapel. Um, and actually, it doesn't give you the full sense because we run this across dozens and dozens of configurations to test portability and different flags and options and things like that. Uh, 1,000 here represents the number of stars on GitHub. So we crossed the 1,000 uh, uh, bar this year. And we're currently at uh, 1,081. And you know, on one hand, stars on GitHub are kind of silly and arbitrary. But on the other hand, um, to some people, they're a mark of pride and uh, an indication of interest in a project. So. If you haven't already started our GitHub repository, please do that. We'd greatly appreciate it. And then the 100 here is the number of individual GitHub contributors. So there's a number of people who have contributed code to Chapel since we started hosting it at GitHub. And that's currently up at something like 106. So that was another nice milestone to get across this year. And we appreciate everyone in the community who does and has contributed code. Speaking of contributors, this is a list of contributors to this year's releases. And I've kind of color-coded and formatted them here. So anyone underlined is presenting at Chew this year. Anyone who is emboldened uh, is a co-author for a Chew paper or presentation. And then light blue represents Google Summer of Code students. Green represents uh, members out in the community. And then dark blue represents the core team at Cray HPE. So what's next for the coming year? Um, there's some obvious things we're going to continue to do. So we want to make that Chapel 2.0 uh, release this coming year. Again, ideally, that'll be this coming fall. Want to continue to support our existing users and any emerging users that come about. And if you are a Chapel user, we want to encourage you to reach out and ask questions or ask for help, particularly if you're struggling with scalability or performance issues. Um, we're going to continue to work on the performance and scalability of Chapel, of course. And we're going to continue to work on portability and um, increasingly performance on the Shasta system. So those are the obvious things, kind of continuing things we've already talked about. Um, some new or renewed efforts that we're going to plan to do this year. Um, I mentioned that we don't have good GPU support in the official chapter release today. So we want to really dig into that. And we're talking about starting on that uh, for this coming fall release. I'll again plug that there are a couple of talks later on in Chu representing some academic efforts, talking about how they're working on targeting Chapel to GPUs. And that shows um, some nice trailblazing work in this area, I think. Uh, we have an LLVM backend for Chapel, and it's been available for years, but it hasn't been on by default. So that's something we want to enable by default for this fall release. And we want to use that to improve our vectorization. Um, Chapel's not often very good at vectorization today. And we've had good success with the LLVM backend and uh, some uh, vectorization plugins for that. So. That's something we hope to invest in more this year. Um, we're also going to be doing general improvements to the compiler in terms of the code architecture, its speed, and its capabilities. Um, and as the language stabilizes, we want to increasingly review and stabilize the standard modules and their interfaces as well. Because of course, library changes can break your code just as much as language changes can. And then a few other efforts not related to the source code or the code base necessarily. Um, so 
we want to retire our existing SourceForge mailing lists if possible and switch over to a discourse-based site, um, which would just be a more modern solution for communicating with the community than mailing lists. We want to launch a chapel blog series, something we've intended to do for a few years but haven't gotten around to. We really hope to get that out for this 2.0 release. And then our website is increasingly looking a bit long in the tooth, so we want to revamp that and modernize it. I want to call out a couple of upcoming workshops. If you didn't get a paper or talking to Chu, or even if you did, um, these are good places to exhibit work on Chapel. Uh, they're both at Supercomputing this fall. The first is PAW ATM, a workshop where we help organize. And this is a workshop that's designed to look at applications written in alternatives to MPI plus X, which of course Chapel is. Um, so if you're doing applications related work in Chapel, um, this would be a great place to uh, send a paper or talk, and the deadline is July 24th. And then the other workshop I'm not as familiar with, uh, but it came across my radar, is uh, ESPM2. Um, this is focused less on just application work and more on the implementations of uh, languages, including traditional languages, um, in particular looking at how they're wrestling with emerging challenges caused by extreme scale computers. So kind of architectural trends that are happening and making programming harder. What are people doing to help with that effort? So if you're working on the implementation of Chapel, um, this would be a great place to submit your work. And I believe it only accepts full research papers. The last thing I wanted to mention is that while the Chapel team may currently be in quarantine, we are still hiring. Um, so this is the team as it exists today. There are about a dozen of us on the team. And we have two open positions currently. Um, and we hope to open maybe three to five more positions in the coming year, COVID willing. I guess everything's a little bit up in the air, but that was the the hope and the plan before COVID hit, and we hope that that might still be the case. So to summarize, a lot of great progress has been made with Chapel over the past year. You've seen a little bit of that today, and there's a lot more that didn't fit into this talk. The Chapel community seems strong and growing, both in terms of the number of users and developers and the work people are getting done. And despite the sad circumstances, uh, we're very happy to have the excuse to hold Chapel, uh, sorry, to hold Chu online this year, uh, and we're glad that you're here and participating. It's nice to be able to involve more people than we've been able to in the past. And again, we want to particularly thank our speakers uh, for going to the trouble of making their talks and doing them online for this. So with that, welcome to CHU 2020, the seventh annual Chapel Implementers and Users Workshop. Uh, again, all of the CHU talks and slides are available online from the CHU website. So if any of the topics you heard about today seem interesting to you, check them out there. Thanks very much.